for having us. Perfect. Great to see you. We've had a fun morning getting to know each other and sort of things going on back and forth. Let's kick it off with a little bit of sort of maybe controversy, I don't know. What's your take on Bitcoin, crypto, finance, FTX, all that sort of stuff? Well, I've had a, a wonderful ride. No question about it. Uh, my, my basic opinion is uh, we're in a very good place in crypto and digital payment now. Uh, basic reasons. All the crypto cowboys have been pushed out of the market by regulators or jailers. <laughs> uh, and so this, this sets up for a more compliant environment where um, the exchanges, and there's many countries where compliant exchanges have existed for quite a while now. Canada's one, uh, they have 1.6 million accounts now, 100% compliant with the regulator of the OSC, that works directly with the SEC. Uh, with the, uh, the impending collapse of finance now, because unfortunately the ownership is a failure, I feel bad for him, but many um, uh, financial institutions by compliance standards can't be on their platform. Right. And so very, uh, very quickly, I think it was a wise move, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu Dhabi set up the M2 exchange, which is siphoning all those assets off, and it's 100% compliant with the ADGM, and the remarkable thing about that exchange, and I have to disclose I'm a shareholder in it, I, I try to buy um, a piece of every compliant exchange because I'm a believer that the infrastructure will be like buying the MISC 200 years ago, right. or you know, NASDAQ, whatever it was founded. And so, in the case of what they've done in M2, is you are forced by compliance to open a bank account in the region that is completely linked to your account. So you're going through to know your client just to clear the banking regulation. So everybody on that exchange is completely clean and uh, lots of institutions are running to it. So I think we're in a great place. I think uh, right after the election, whoever wins it, we'll see the Stablecoin Act yeah. come through, which will be the first wave of digital payment. Uh, and, and, and I think, and I've worked on that bill with the senators involved, I think this is all good. And so, you know, the, the, the cowboys that set it up and got us going in the 2020, 2021 period all have arrows on their backs and we thank them for their service. I know you're a big fan of ETFs, Bitcoin ETF, it's a go. I am, I don't use it, but I think I would never pay the fees, I just own the coin myself on an exchange. But it's great to see that this has happened because it's the beginning of the regulated environment clearly that we've always seen. Now there's 11 licenses, I think three will survive, but that's just the nature of the ETF market. Uh, if you're a Fidelity or BlackRock, you have a giant market in the behemoth machine, you'll gather the assets, other guys will be dead soon. So I know uh, most of you know Kevin because of Shark Tank. I uh, have a side hustle, I go up to Pelican Bay, which is a supermax prison, and we run a shoot Shark Tank for the entrepreneurs inside, trying to get them to do legal enterprises. Tell us, uh, Kevin, the coolest recent Shark Tank winner and what you're excited about. Well, I think it's a great question because I'd like to disclose to everybody what the model is for Shark Tank and why it has survived 15 years and why it works in the first place and why it's very applicable to FinTech. So, the secret sauce, let's just take the stats of venture capital that haven't changed since they were measured in Boston in the late 50s. You do 10 deals, you wait five years, two out of the 10 make you all your returns, the rest either go out of business or are living dead. And the challenge of every VC firm is, how do you manage the living dead? You suck all the energy and time out of you. My preference is always to take them behind the bar and shoot them after 36 months. And I think that's the, the, the kind thing to do because these great entrepreneurs are stuck in this treadmill like that, you know, like a road that's going round and round and round when you know the business isn't going to work for whatever reason, and you help them on their journey. Because I prefer to invest in entrepreneurs that have failed two or three times and have learned from their mistakes. And, and if, you don't, if you don't help them go through the catharsis of shooting a business behind the barn, they never do it. I'm very good at that, and so they appreciate me for it, and I know that. And so, so if you're up on a farm, don't go outside. No, but you gotta pick your two. After 36 months, pick your two, feed those, shoot the rest. I don't mean literally shoot the rest. I mean, 
Yes, I do. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, now here's the secret sauce that we should apply for this. Think about a marginal business on Shark Tank primarily concerned with goods and services. Yeah. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. Some widget or whatever. Their biggest problem, and the reason most of them fail, is they're never able to get their customer acquisition costs below the lifetime value of the customer. A fancy way of saying they go bankrupt, advertising. That's what happens to them. So Google has money. Yes, and they don't care how many come through the system. It's brilliant. It's a great model. But in the case of Shark Tank, 3.2 million eyeballs to 90 airs. Then it goes into syndication where it's 98 more million eyeballs every 12 month cycle in perpetuity. So if you can somehow get on that show, in many cases, they never have any cost for customer acquisition. So a marginal product now has no advertising cost. Now, if you notice over the years, what the sharks have done is they've tried to figure out, looking at the deal, because they never see it before they come on, how many will I sell the night it airs? So the only capital you're risking is called Shark Tank night capital. So <laughs> if you get it right, you get all your money back in 48 hours. And so we're all looking at each other saying, okay, it's a widget. How many people would use this widget? We know 3.2 million will see the widget, and we also have relationships with all of the online retailers. I mean, 15 years of this model has really worked out, so we stock Amazon, because most people won't go to the website of the widget maker, but Amazon will have it there on the Shark Tank Week special. Boom, you've got all your money back in 48 hours. So all the rest of the returns are positive free cash. Now, I like royalties, because I'd argue to everybody they're better than equity. Every time one of these things gets acquired and I'm the royalty guy, all roads lead to me. Because either they want to buy out the royalty or they want a new relationship. And that's worked for me for 15 years. Other people don't agree with royalties. I don't care. I think it's a wonderful way. Work for George Lucas. What's that? Work for George Lucas with figurines. Yes. I mean, that's. You know. Anyways, the point is. It's a wonderful model to learn from because it goes back to the whole fintech thing. The reason I got involved in fintech in the first place, we have a company here called Bean Sauce, and we sell survey promotion. We're here looking for a banking partner because I never want to build credit or debt platforms. I've built a fantastic tech stack for investing, but you know I don't want to rebuild it again and because I'm an indexer at an ETF company and we use these products to provide investment services, but. Somewhere in this room is my partner at banking. I don't know where you are, but you've got to see my CEO, Connor. It's Connor at beanstocks.com. Shameless promotion. But talk to him because we want to partner with you to provide these services to our platform. That's why I'm here. But just a takeaway there, legit, he's looking around and giving her a problem. Yes, that's why, you know, that's why I'm here. But each shark, finishing off that story of Shark Tank, has built a platform of millions of followers. And so we built our own television network, and we now sell advertising on our platforms. And so if it's a portfolio company in mind, they get to advertise for free. And there is where we reduce our CAC by around 25 to 30%. It's our secret weapon, and thank you Shark Tank, but it took 15 years to build. Yeah, good things take a little while to impress. So when you started being stocks, it was kind of like, is it yet another robo-advisor? What makes you different? What makes you special? You know, I, I get an on, onslaught of people asking for investment advice every day. Hundreds, if not thousands, a week. How do I build a portfolio? And most people think, oh, go on an online platform and start picking stocks. Nobody does that. There's 100 million Americans making $62,000 a year that have never bought a stock. Never bought, a, never bought a trade, and never will. And so you've got to figure out a way to say, okay, put 10 bucks a week aside, or 20 bucks, or whatever it is on your paycheck, and we will instantly index you to the market or to a fixed income portfolio. You don't have to think about it. We'll mark your market every day for you, and you can see it on your app. That's what the motivation was for being saw. So I can say, look, go to this. This is how I invest. But I don't expect you to pick stocks or read the covenants of a fixed income bond. Nobody does that. 
So this original vision of, oh, we're going to do these trading platforms, that doesn't work for America. Our biggest challenge here is financial literacy at the high school age. And I'm a huge advocate of that. And we in Florida now, we have that in high school, saying, look, here's what a credit card is, here's what debt is, here's how you have to manage it, here's your credit score. And then the minute you get a job, start taking 50% of that paycheck and stick it in something that index you in the market so that you can make the seven, eight, nine percent returns over 30 years of your career and end up with 1.6 million in the bank that you can actually live off. That's how we have to solve this problem. And stock is one application to do that. Now I back it because I'm a believer in this, but we've done a lot of work on this over the years to try and make it easier every single quarter. So clearly that's a, a, an approach to helping build wealth for others. Do you feel like um, banking should be merged with that or should be independent? How do you think about spending that money? Yeah. These are two different things. Um, you know, in the beginning of FinTech, when I started watching the investments before it drew it, he was picking these unique verticals, like pet owners or underbanked people or this or that or that, and nobody did it. Everyone was trying to build on each other's operation. Right. And, and they had a secret sauce in customer acquisition that got slaughtered. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that never made it because of CAC. And it's not just CAC, it's ROAS, return on ad spend, because at some point you have to start spending and you need a two and a half ROAS minimum. And so when we look at companies in FinTech and say, who's doing the social media? Who's doing the digital buy? Who's managing that? And show me how you calculate your CAC. Most people do not calculate CAC correctly because they don't take into account the churn or the cost of the infrastructure to manage the market or the agency fees if they're using an agency. I know how to calculate CAC and I'll rip it to pieces and find out what it really is. So if you think your CAC's 150 bucks, I bet you it's 800. Like that's really the way I look at it because the proof is in the pudding. The company makes no free cash flow. The CAC is sucking the throat. How do you think? Folks in the room should think about growing a BSC fintech. So you've obviously got a brand and you're amplifying the real message. Is that the story? Everyone should find a brand? It works for some people, but what, I, what I've learned in 15 years is the companies that are successful in fintech too can tell a story. They can engage in a story about their mission and they create these communities about why you should engage with their platform. I'll give you a glowing example of this. Not FinTech, but it's, it, it drives home the point. A company called Base Paws. Now, Base Paws does cat DNA testing. Cool. $29 to have your cat DNA tested. So you can modify its diet to extend its life. Most cats die because they're undernourished based on their genes or they get an abscess tooth and you can't do root canal, the cat dies. Anna Steyer was her name, she came on Shark Tank, I don't know, four or five years ago. Nobody wanted to do that thing. She started telling her story about cats. This was pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. 2019. And I've listened to her story and say, damn, she loves cats. No, I hate cats, but I like money. I, I like money, and she was, she was <laughs> Explain that $29 kit for cat DNA. I said, Dad, I can buy a new cat for five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I can buy a new cat for five bucks. And she said, Look, there's 110 million cats in America, and I have built a platform where people talk about their cats and extending their lives, and they buy my kits for me. And I thought, Okay, let's take a flyer on them. And I bought her to the deal. Within 36 months, she sold it to a pharma company for a number so big, it's the first time in Shark Tank history, that we could not disclose the purchase. <laughs> and so it was the largest IRR in Shark Tank history. They wanted the data. Yeah. They didn't give a shit about the cats. Nobody gets that cats. the data sets that she had built up to, to design more foods and medicines for cats. So it was about her whole, she spent nothing on digital, nothing. She created a community of people that love cats and talked about what you need to do to extend their lives. And I thought, that's it. 
if story comes to the companies, including FinTechs, they can say, look, here's our mission, here's what we do for you, here's why we care about you, and all of a sudden, you're in this direct communication with the customer, and you build services and product around that, and you try and spend nothing with Google. Their mission is to spend, they're already rich, you don't need to do that. <laughs> so that's the whole idea. Those are the successful companies. I love that. I think, um, you know, we had some success today, and then Sintero just announced a new funding round. I know the market's been pretty tough for lots of folks. What do you think is going to happen in the IPO market? Do you think things are going to unlock? We're going to get some opportunities for people to go public this year? No, it's going to take a while longer, and I'll tell you where I draw the stats from. I play quite a bit in the private equity market and the software wealth market. There's an index there, and I do some work in the UAE. And so, if you look at this current round of funds, big ones, we're talking about multi billion dollar funds. So, most private equity firms and hedge funds and large venture firms go to the sovereign wealth markets in Saudi, in the UAE, in Qatar, in Sweden, in Denmark, and say, look, we're raising fund 15, whatever it is. Um, the last fund returned, you know, 18 percent, whatever it is. This last generation of fund raised in the last 36 months has only deployed 8 percent of the drawdown. It's the lowest. Ever. So people that are going looking for new dollars, they're saying, well, we've already put money to work. We've committed it, and only 8% of it has been deployed. And that's the, the, the reason that's happened, in my view, in my opinion, is rates went up so fast that the seller's expectations are still up here, but the buyer realizes that the cost of capital is going 30% on the leverage side. So you can't borrow at 4.2, you're borrowing at 7.5, 8. I don't care what model you're looking at. So you can't afford to overpay anyone. So we're stuck in this situation where the landlord and the tenant can't agree on the rent, so to speak. And we're waiting for that to flush out. Meanwhile, back at the farm, no one's raising money because most sovereign guys are saying, and the majority of money invested in Europe is sovereign wealth and pension, saying there's no game in town. And so we're in a really weird place. And yet the economy is still going. Obviously, the election adds volatility, but that's where we're at. And the IP market's kind of ground to a halt as a result of this. For you at Beanstalks, do you need Ventura or do you just want that to make things good? How to say that again? Do you need Ventura to expand Beanstalks or is it small no. thing? I mean, our secret sauce is, I'm not sure we have the lowest, but uh, we probably have one of the lowest caps just because you know, we have our network. I've got 8.6 million investors in the, in the world of, uh, you know, of, of, of Mr. Wonderful, the Wonder Man, if you want to know that. And I take advantage of it, and I'm totally transparent about it, and I've got a great team managing it, and we work with all the cable and network operators, all the social media platforms. The key to this is content. So every day we have to generate content insert the ads into. Mm. And so the new model on cable is, I'll do Fox, I'll do CNN, I'll do Yahoo, I'll do whatever. And we feed each other. They sell ads, we sell ads. And linear television is declining 3 to 5% a year. And streaming is going up at the same rate. And so streaming, you can measure your impact with pixels. You implement, you implement pixels into it. And you'll know right away if you're spiking your website. So we offer those services in television. We, we try and, I mean, these are really volatile times, but it's all about CAC. Yeah. So when I look at deals, I say, who's running social media? Oh, we have an agency. Take that piece of paper, throw it in the garbage, look at the next one. Because if you haven't figured that out, no one's going to find you. Do you think that applies to everybody? Yeah, 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 everybody. I mean, that, they may not tell you why they're not funding you, but it's because you have to figure it out. You don't know what you're doing. And you know, the first slide in your deck, 12 slides, I can't stand watching more than 12 slides, is <laughs> here's our CAC, here's how we calculate, here's our rise. If I see that, I go, oh, all right. All right, so. Well, I'm only pouring gasoline on their fire. Perfect. So if you're here pitching Kevin, you've got that fintech that's doing banking, focus on CAC and rise. Yeah, I mean, and I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to find a banking partner that's figured that out. So we can add investment services, robo investment, or direct investment, or T-bill investing, or indexing, right onto that platform. 
Really? Because I'm never going to build that. I'm never going to start from scratch. No, it's a it's a hard gap. It's not worth it. I'm just applying so hard. Well, there you have it. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks. It's really great and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Peter. Please welcome.